get your attention. Um, well done on being so bright and sparkly at this early, early hour. Uh, my name is Miriam Houghton. I'm a lecturer in drama and theatre studies here. And I'm really excited about today and the panels. Um, and I'm really excited about the weather. I like this all the time. <laughs> So we're going to have two, um, two papers and then we'll leave questions to the end, like with yesterday. And the first paper is by Dr. Profana Corcaesta. Right. And she is a lecturer in theatre and performance at Plymouth University. She's the author of the monograph Indian Modern Dance, Feminism and Transnationalism, recently out with Palgrave Macmillan's New World Choreography series. Her other publications include essays in Dance Research Journal, South Asia Research, and Studies in South Asian Film and Media. Uh, Profana is a contemporary performance maker whose practices research examines issues around the politics of feminist embodiment. And I just love that. Okay. And her, uh, her talk today is What's with the Red Dot on the Forehead? Intercultural Marking in Hitan Patel's Ten. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, everybody, for being awake and, uh, and, and being here after what was a really fascinating day yesterday and a very full and rich day. Um, as you may sort of be aware from the biography, I bring a slightly different flavor to the feast here. Um, I trained in dance in India. I grew up in India um, and I was 25 when I moved to the UK and I was trained uh, in contemporary dance by two feminist choreographers. But my research interest as well as my, my practice examines the, the interrelationship between, uh, between movement, text, dance and theatre. I'm very interested in physical theatre as well as live art practices. Um, today's paper is not about my practice but uh, it is absolutely guided by um, my experience and my own embodied experience of being a practitioner. Um, and so um, it, is, it, comes, it, it comes from a very raw place, and the paper is also quite raw. It comes out of and after uh, the publication of my monograph, which examined 20th century movements uh, uh, across India, Europe, and, uh, and North America, um, and also Southeast Asia. So uh, kind of South-Southeast Asia dialogues and South-North dialogues. Um, it, it, in, in the modern, in the 20th century modern period, in the ways in which uh, dance and theatre products travelled across continents. Um, but post the publication of that book, um, I'm quite interested in looking at uh, how bodies are read, and particularly how bodies of colour are read in performance. Um, so this particular piece of paper uh, comes from that place, from that, um, from that um, position of having been read and having been marginalized or having been stereotyped uh, as, as a brown Asian body in the past. Um, and so it is, uh, it is a place of anger, a raw anger, but I don't want you to think that this place, that this paper is a sort of displacement of anger. It's not just venting rage, but I hope it's a little <laughs> bit more than that. Um, so I'd just like to begin um, uh, before I actually launch into the uh, paper with a small prologue. The intercultural theatre of the 1980s and 90s were instrumental in opening up critical dialogues around notions of selfhood and otherness. Scholars such as Rustam Barucha, who remains conspicuous by his absence right now, but uh, <laughs> he ha they have alerted us to the power differentials at play within very well-intentioned but ultimately the um, unethical encounters. The other was often assumed to be a unified concept in such cultural exchanges. So basically, the other was always, there was always the, the tendency to assume that something authentic or real would be found out there. Yeah? This paper is interested in noticing what happens when the culturally marked body of the other in present day intercultural theatre can no longer uphold that unity or certainty of cultural experience and instead signals a continuous fracturing of identities owing to displacement, migration, and transnational citizenship. So in other words, what new possibilities and meanings emerge when such fragmented and hyphenated bodies speak back and renegotiate relations with dominant cultural practices in the act of performance? So Rick Knowles has pointed out, uh, and he is conspicuous by his presence here, thank you Rick for being, <laughs> for being bright and early. Um, he's pointed out how, and I quote, new hybrid and diasporic subjectivities are performatively forged in the intercultural theater of global cities today. And uh, following that interest, this paper focuses on the work of the British Asian artist Hiten Patel, 
a work which um, offers a constant questioning of the assumed universalism of ethnic identities. The paper also notices the ways in which intercultural performance work, such as Patel's, exposes the neo-oriental and neo-colonial desire of the audience to consume bodies of color. Therefore, the opening section of this paper focuses on how the skin, how uh, the, uh, the skin as the outer layer covering the body, can become an important semiotic field within an intercultural encounter between performer and audience. So the first section of my paper is titled The Disappointing Skin. It's Halloween night. A slim crowd has gathered outside the Roland Levinsky Theatre on the Plymouth University campus. As we wait for the doors to open, I overhear a couple of people standing nearby saying how excited they are about this Indian classical show that they're about to see. During the post-show talk, those very audience members seemed clearly very disappointed. After all, the experimental devised performance given by the British Asian contemporary artist Hethen Patel offered no virtuosic display of Indian classical dance or music. Perhaps the Peninsula Arts Programme brochure, and Peninsula Arts is the arts organisation which is housed on, uh, on campus at Plymouth University, perhaps the programme brochure featuring a close-up image of Patel's brown body and with its reference to the 10-beat rhythmic cycle from Indian classical music that offers a conceptual framework to the performance had led some to believe that this was going to be a performance of colour. Witnessing the frustration of my fellow members of fellow audience members reinforced for me the epistemic rupture that has historically accompanied and continues to inform modernity. As post-colonial theorist Deepesh Chakraborty states, if modernity, and I quote him, is to be a definable delimited concept, then we must identify some people and practices as non-modern, close quote. The event I've just shared with you suggests that for some, or perhaps many, Brown skin in performance equals non-modern traditional work. When it offers none, it disappoints. This paper is specifically interested in critically interrogating the role and function of the brown skin, or of the skin in general, in performance. It locates the ways in which strategies of blockage and deliberate disappointment enable British Asian works such as TEN to reveal not only inherent assumptions about ethnicity and cultural products, but also expose the audience's voyeuristic tendencies to consume fetishized skin in intercultural encounters. In other words, I'm interested in the ways in which culturally marked bodies force us to look closely at skin as the palimpsestic surface of a complex lived experience. The epidermalization of performance. During this research process, my thoughts first turned to the obvious color an uh, obvious problem of colour politics surrounding the skin and how the skin as a value-laden signifier is received and read during the act of a performance. In his celebrated work, Black Skin, White Masks, Franz Fanon referred to the, and I quote him, epidermalization of inferiority inherent in race relations. In Fanon's work, skin has a profound impact, physically and psychically, in what he calls the epidermal racial schema. The skin plays a crucial role in constructing difference. But reading culturally marked or colored skin and the semiotic problems it poses in performance is not the only place where I want to park myself. So let's move on from pigment to movement. The first area of my discussion is to see how the skin may serve as a useful conceptual metaphor for us to respond to at least two sets of queries that have become important in discussions around representation in postmodern dance and theatre. First, what constitutes movement? And second, what is movement constitutive of? As the largest organ of the human body, the skin, which appears to our visual, visual field as a seemingly stable and static surface, actually comprises of dynamic movement. Cells move up through its various strata, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis, changing their shape and composition all the time. There is constant movement in skin. Mike Pearson, in his keynote speech at the IFTR conference at the University of Warwick last summer, drew conceptual metaphors from geology and archaeology to respond to the idea of stratification in theatre. 
In geological rock formations, Pearson noted, the deeper you go, the older it gets. But if we use skin as a metaphor to think, to think through performance or movement, then we encounter the very opposite phenomena. The older layer of reduced movement or non-movement is at the top, on the surface, which is visible, whilst the youngest, the newest, or the fastest movement in skin lies underneath, completely hidden and unmanifest to the eye. In skin, therefore, movement offers an accumulative and generative function. This inversion of the old and new is a concept that I will return to later on in the talk. My fascination with skin led me to research how it is described and defined through language in Western and non-Western medicinal studies. In European mainstream medicine, the skin is believed to fulfill a number of functions. It insulates, regulates, senses, synthesizes, protects, acts as a barrier, excretes, absorbs, heals, and repairs. In non-Western medicinal practices, such as Ayurveda from South Asia, the skin is believed to be comprised of not three, but seven layers. It acts as a mirror, reflects the body's interiority, balances, nurtures, transforms sensations, regenerates. I was struck by how the functions of the skin in both Western and Ayurvedic medicine are similar to the many functions of performance, to synthesize, absorb, excrete, balance, nurture, transform, repair, and regenerate ideas and lived experience. The attraction for human skin, its potency as a living surface for self-inscription and transformation, and its potential for affect in performance, has had a solid presence in the history of performance. In the Anglo-American world, the skin, along with the body, has received intense attention from performance and live artists from the 1970s onwards. The list of artists who have used the body surface as a site of resistance and a source of identity politics is exhaustive. It includes works as diverse as Marina Abramovich's The Lips of Thomas, 1975, in which she used a razor blade to etch a five-pointed star on her stomach, Stellark suspensions in which his body was suspended and wired by hooking the skin in several, spaces, uh, several places, and Ron Athey's masochistic performance artworks that usually involve extreme skin modification and transformation. Kathy O'Dell, in her book Contract with the Skin, suggests that in most performance artworks of the kind that I've just mentioned, it is the performer's contract with the audience that is carefully examined and brought under scrutiny. The real power of the agreement between the audience and the performer lies in the structure of the contract. And skin helps to redefine the terms of that engagement. Performance art, according to Odell, is interested in dramatizing the importance of a transaction between audience and performer that is often overlooked or taken for granted. In Hathen Patel's work too, the skin plays a crucial role in making visible that invisible contract between the doer and the onlooker. Like many other performance artists, Hethen Patel's practice demands that we attend to the taken for grantedness of the pact between the performing body and the gazing eye. Since his early days studying fine art as an undergraduate student, Patel had always been interested in writing and inscribing as cathartic processes, which were documented via a range of formats, including photography and film. Patel's earliest forays into writing on different media was spurred by his interest in creating sculptural forms out of written texts. But his engagement with a more bodily encounter with inscribing and writing transpired accidentally when he noticed how rich the visual signifier of his framed and inscribed brown body became to the lens's eye. As a young artist whose concern predominantly centered on making sense of his dual or hyphenated identity as British and Asian, Patel found the surface of his body to be a valuable site for experiments in self-portraiture. For a period, the different skins, as he calls them in, uh, in an in-person interview, in photography, live work, and video coexisted in parallel until he began to be centrally engaged in the live body. Patel's sacred bodies, first made in 2006, explored his skin as a site for discussions on cultural identity to be housed. 
For Pradel, the marking of his exterior skin involved transforming and playing with the visual signifiers of his identity, his face and his body, and self-imposing a second layer of colour onto his own skin. Patel used non-permanent stain, hina, or the red powder kanku, um, hina in, in this image, kanku in the next following images, both of which are commonly associated with Hindu religious rituals. Hina is also a highly gendered substance, mm -hmm. mostly used by women of the South Asian subcontinent to decorate their palms. By decorating his skin, Patel seems to offer his body as an emasculated object of empire. Mm -hmm. Instead of permanent tattooing, Patel was drawn to the idea of reapplying the same substance, redefining marks and patterns onto his skin. As he mentions in his personal interview, his Indian heritage and background mm -hmm. was a dislocating concept for him. Patel was born and raised in the United Kingdom to Indian Gujarati parents, and the stage at which he received or was presented with an Indian native culture was already defined and prescribed for him. Therefore, in his 2006 work, Sacred Bodies, Patel kept redefining the marks on his body for himself, but the audience received the photographic art of Patel's henna tattooed body as a given, as a product. They were not let into the live process of skin marking and transformation, but saw only the final stage where they were presented with the visual image. In Sacred Bodies, Patel wanted his audience to receive his body as a fetishized object, just as he received his Indianness from his Gujarati parents as a highly fetishized cultural heritage. If we position Patel's practice within a genealogy of live art or performance artworks that involve skin transformation, then some crucial questions arise. I realize that the practitioners I had mentioned earlier, Abramovich, Athey, and Stellark, offer forms of inscription or self-inscription that are very different from Patel's. In the works of all three practitioners, the skin communicates, but it also receives. It receives pain through a physical opening up of the body. In Patel's work, one might argue, the skin only communicates and does not receive any pain. It is never cut open, sliced, hooked, or punctured. But could we take a moment out from our reverence for bleeding skin in live art work and cast our thoughts to skin that does not bleed, but is nevertheless punctured? In other words, what about the pain of inhabiting skin that is constantly marked and punctured by the gaze? Sacred bodies played on the idea of the fetishized and racially objectified brown body and aimed to counter the orientalist gaze of Patel's audience. In this work, Patel seemed to rework the notion of the sacred onto his skin, suggesting that that which is sacred is not necessarily inscribed or bound, but often impermanent, found and refound. Since Sacred Bodies, Patel has forayed into a number of areas of performance making, which includes video work, live art, and installations of sculptures. In 2013, for instance, in collaboration with his father and brother, Patel combi combined popular culture, autobiography and cultural critique to construct a new sculpture, a squatting Ford Fiesta Transformer. <laughs> Patel's Transformer, as opposed to the super powerful giants of the Hollywood movie franchise, is at once a homage to British Asian middle class immigrant labor. His father worked in a Ford manufacturing factory in Britain. And in his words, also to Indian lower, lower class ways of performing rank through the body, but I have issues with this. I don't think squatting is a lower, lower class way of performing rank, but that's, that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, Patel responded to his childhood obsession with Kung Fu and Bruce Lee to make Be Like Water, a work for the theater where he speaks, but in Chinese, and a female dancer mediates his spoken text. In his recent works, as in his 2000 work 10, which I'll be talking about and showing you, mimicry features quite constantly, suggesting that there is an absence of a linguistic norm for Patel. Frederick Jameson in Postmodernism has famously critiqued the postmodern penchant for pastiche, which he calls blank parody. Pastiche is, like parody, the imitation of a peculiar or unique idiosyncratic style, the wearing of a linguistic mask, Jameson suggests, <coughs> speech in a dead language. But it is a neutral practice of such mimicry, without any of parody's ulterior motives, amputated of the satiric impulse, devoid of laughter, according to Jameson once again. But Patel's use of mimicry certainly seems to feature the very thing that Jameson finds lacking in postmodern parody, political bite. 
The performance of mimicry in Patel's work, and certainly in his work 10, serves to emphasize that cultural heritage is learned through repetition, that our constructed identities are acquired and imposed rather than being a natural given. And I'll show you the first video clip to just kind of um, elucidate my points. So I'm going right. to go here. You know, I kind of feel like speaking it isn't enough. But now I'm talking about it, because I'm part of it. So, how many times do you speak in Gujarat? I don't know how many times do you speak in Gujarat. But, oh, I don't know how many times do you speak in Gujarat. Now, if you're not familiar with this language, my use of it can start to sound convincing. <laughs> but I'm just not sure it feels like it to me, or whether it feels like I go into kind of imitation mode. Sounds odd, but sometimes I feel like I'm just imitating someone who's actually Gujarati. And, you know, if, if that is the case, then, you know, what would it mean for me to imitate somebody from a completely different culture to mine? You know, could I get into their head? Or can I understand their mindset? Can I understand the mindset of someone part Lancastrian, part Barbadian, part West African, and a whole host of other histories just by talking like them? Can I take on their physical history just by standing like them? Can I feel up until the age of 17, I play football for Berry Boys and learn my dancing moves on the pitch, maybe sharp and quick? And if I speak with another accent, can I feel that I was born in Bells Hill, Scotland, with a Celtic blood in my veins? Can I feel that up to the age of nine, I was dressed in a kilt, and I was so happy when I got my first pair of long trousers that I didn't care that they were hand me downs from my sister? <laughs> Can I feel allegiance to the McDonald clan or a distrust of the Campbells? It doesn't it feel like it to me. Or maybe I just need speaking more. Repeat it. Or maybe I just need speaking more. Repeat it. <laughs> so the excerpt that I've just shown you is from TEN, an intercultural collaborative work that was Hiten Patel's first piece of live performance for the theatre, featuring Patel himself, Mark Evans, a Scottish drummer, and Dave Stickman Higgins, a drummer of West Indian, Irish, and British Lancastrian heritage. The piece involved spoken text and scored, structured and choreographed movement sequences in which the bodies of three men move sometimes in tandem and sometimes against each other as they negotiate race, complex rhythmic cycles, and red vermilion powder, or kanku. Ten is part theater, part choreography, a piece that revolves around the autobiographical narratives of three men who, and I quote them from the performance, cannot quite put a finger on who they really are. Patel begins Ten with an informal meet and greet and direct address to the audience. He casually shares his story of growing up as the only brown kid in school in Bolton, United Kingdom, and of his struggle to understand his classmates' fixation and curiosity about the red dot worn by Indian women on their forehead. And he found that very strange, considering he wasn't wearing it at the time. <laughs> From the very beginning of the performance, Patel resists the, dist the distancing effect that Emilia Jones suggests many live artists also engage in. Using the tropes of live art performance, Patel draws his audience closer to his personal narrative, but then begins to thwart their expectations. For he psychs up his audience for a stunning display of virtuosic tabla playing when he shares the story of his training in Indian classical music as part of his need to understand his Indian heritage. But he does not play a single sound on the drums when they are brought in. I'll show you the second clip now. It's three minutes, 12. And then, 
Many years later, um, I came across another theory from about being Indian. Um, and this was that actually the key to being Indian is Indian rhythm. And the greats of Indian classical music would claim that to gain a familiarity with Indian rhythm is to gain an insight into an Indian mindset or Indian thought. Now, I love this idea. You know, I had no idea if it was true or not, but you know, I didn't care about that I had to find out. So I rushed right out, I bought myself a set of Indian double drums, ordered them on eBay and they arrived on the post. Obviously, they came from an Asian shop, so they didn't come quite as quickly as that. <laughs> <laughs> and so the drums arrived, and I found research myself where to find a drum teacher. And I remember kind of excitedly taking the drums around to his house, and we would start to have these lessons. Actually, that's a lie. First, uh, he would make me take my shoes off. And uh, also, you have to take socks off. It was, uh, it was kind of a mark of respect before you enter this arena that you learn the drums. And, you know, I kind of felt Indian already because when I used to go to temple as a kid, uh, you know, you have to be barefoot then as well. And, I don't know, actually everything about this first lesson <coughs> felt, in a way, <coughs> like taking lessons in being Indian. Like, you know, you have to sit with your uh, legs crossed on the floor and, you know, you have to be aware of your posture, your back straight. Um, and you learn that there's kind of a specific way to hold your hands on the drums. And I like that as well, that you use your hands, not sticks. You know, I've grown up eating food with my hands, so again, it kind of felt kind of Indian. Um, and you kind of quickly learn, as you learn the drums, that as well as the physical drum part, there's also a, a vocal, chanted counterpart to the drumming. And actually, you're not allowed to touch the drums um, until you learn this vocal part. Um, I guess the, the best way to explain it is, say if you have a keyboard or a piano, and you know if you run your fingers up, the notes kind of go A, B, C, D, etc. Um, well, it's the same on the drums, except the different places that you hit the drums um, make different sounds, and uh, the notes that instead of A, B, C, the names of the notes are actually da, te, de, 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 and this is kind of vast rhythm vocabulary. Um, so anyway, I'm taking these lessons and learning all these new things, and sooner or later I start to wonder when it is that I'm going to start to have these Indian thoughts. <laughs> you know. So, Patel's hands hover over the tabla, constantly on the verge of demonstrating virtuosity as he offers a lengthy preamble about his preparation for and learning how to play an Indian classical instrument. But he ultimately offers no satisfying rhythmic display to his spectators. The tabla arrives in the space as a sacred object, a piece of heritage that is symbolic but ultimately of no real consequence to the actions in the theatre. It is like Patel's skin, culturally marked, old, a given. Although Ten offers no virtuosity, it does offer a different kind of display instead. As Patel, Evans and Higgins begin to unfold their personal stories of confused belonging, hyphenated identities and colliding cultures, their bodies begin to move in a scored rhythmic pattern, their voices overlap in a layered structure of polyphonic syllables, and their hands begin to explore the red kanku which is placed on a plate on stage. Soon their pristine white shirts are taken off, and their bare torsos begin to get marked in dark red powder as the scored movements of their red smeared hands slicing the air impacts on their bare flesh. This is the last penultimate clip. Ding, ding, na, ding, 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 na, ding, ding, na, ding, 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 
skin gets acted upon. In 10, the performer's arms move over their torsos, slicing it vertically and horizontally until the red powder mixed with their sweat marks glistening crosses on their bodies. As all three men negotiate their Scottishness, Jamaicanness, and Indianness, repetition seems to be a deliberate strategy to distance us from a pure enjoyment of their bodies. The significance of the red cross of the English national flag emblazoned on their skin is not lost on the audience. But instead of virile nationalism, the three men expose the impermanence of their identities. The marking on their bodies solicits the audience's desires, for the three bare torsos invite our gaze towards the spectacle of revealed skin. But the violent slicing of the arms and the sharpness with which the three men shout out their rhythms make any comfortable consumption of revealed skin and spectacle impossible. In the final moments of 10, when the performers exit the space, the stage floor can be seen covered in red powder. But when Patel finally removes the plate of red kanku from the floor, the audience is left with the image of a dark dot framed by the scattered red powder on the floor in the closing moments of this performance.
This is a powerful return to and visualization of Patel's opening concern with the red dot on the forehead as a cultural sign, except that 10 finishes not with a clean, fulsome whole of the dot, but instead with a very messy and Derridean absent presence of the red dot. So to conclude, in this paper, I've focused on the work of the artist Hethen Patel to locate the ways in which strategies of blockage and deliberate disappointment enable postmodern British Asian works such as tend to reveal not only certain inherent assumptions about ethnicity, race, and cultural products, but also expose the audience's voyeuristic tendencies to consume fetishized bodies of color. I've attempted to read the intercultural performance works of artists such as Patel's as embodied materials that place corporeal experience at the center of discourses on cultural identity, inserting the marked body firmly within discussions on the heterogeneity and multiplicity of languages. In denying any authenticity or legitimacy of his cultural heritage, Patel resists one of the foundational tenets of early interculturalism, and yet, I would argue, offers a new illegitimate interculturalism that is nevertheless profound. In Patel's kin work, a historical language of archaeology, layers, traces, and palimpsests seem to be evoked, just as much as a futurist language of cyborgs and technology emerges from the metal skin of his transformer. His kin-based performances offer a powerful inversion of the archaeological metaphor in that his older, given, and culturally marked skin becomes the entry point to a newer, invisible skin of infinite new possibilities. In this paper, I've been interested in the ways that the experience of contemporary intercultural performance reveal how our human skin is attributed, and I quote from uh, Sarah Emmett and Stacey, um, uh, and yeah, Emmett and Stacey, uh, how the human skin is attributed a meaning and logic of its own. Also, as Kavana et al. have suggested, skin has a biological life, a social life, a fantasy life, a somatic life, a political life, an aesthetic life, a life in the lived body, and a cultural life, all of which inform one another to shape what it means and how it feels to inhabit skin. Skin, like intercultural performance, is not simply a surface layer of inscribed culture, but a living, mutating, moving structure of stratified meaning, and perhaps useful in offering us a way into a decolonized engagement with, with performing bodies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pravana. That was absolutely fascinating. We're going to dig into it a lot much later. Uh, but now I'm going to welcome our next speaker. So uh, can I introduce you to Victor Ladron de Guevara? Sorry. <laughs> who is also a lecturer in theatre and performance at Plymouth. Uh, his scholarly work is centred on the exploration of intercultural theatre, the use and understanding of the body and performance, and the interrelationship between theory and practice. He's 16 years uh, experience as a performer and director working from Mexico and England, and is trained in a range of diverse disciplines embracing aspects of Eastern as well as Western theatre practice. Currently, in collaboration with Dr. Rachel Hahn, he's developing a new section in studies in theatre and performance solely dedicated to the dissemination of practices research projects. So welcome. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very, very much for that. It was amazing. And uh, thank you as well, Charles and Jason, for inviting us. It's been amazing. It's been really, really lovely. Um, the caveats, the starting caveats of all papers, and to kind of, you know, just to take it away and saying, sorry, I'm very, very sorry for what is going to happen. The next one is the is perspective that I'm taking is from the practitioner researcher. So even though this is not a practice as research project as itself, it emerges from the development of a practice as research project. What is coming here, it's began as a practice as research project, but it later on started developing in different ways. And I am now going back to it because I am starting to theorize and think very, very differently about what I did. And the other thing that is actually very, very important to say is actually in the, uh, it says that it's auto-ethnographic intercultural performances. And in fact, I was quite too ambitious when I first sent my abstract. And it's going to be just a performance that I'm going to be talking about. And instead of talking about auto-ethnographic, I'm going to talk about a single performance which was autobiographical. So I start. This paper will question the role played by translation in the process of devising arts practice as research project which situated itself with an intercultural framework. 
parting from the premise that all intercultural performances depend on a process of translation, this paper will discuss three different models of cross-cultural or intercultural exchange aiming to highlight the ways in which the translational praxis has remained largely unchallenged, often reduced to a mere linguistic process and closely attached to issues related to colonization and appropriation. Although arguably, translation is a fundamental part of most intercultural encounters, its assumptions, methodologies, strategies and function are rarely analyzed or questioned by people that work in the intercultural field and that use it either as a theoretical in, or in the theoretical or in the practical explorations. On the one hand, a translation is commonly thought of as a literary metier and therefore outside of the field of research of theater <coughs> practitioners. Unless, of course, the focus is on the study of dramatic text. On the other hand, when translation constitutes is in itself taken for granted, that is, it's usually understood as a process that is based on transfer and distance. In that sense, uh, and I quote Anthony Pym, quote, if there is, were no material transfers, if texts were not moved across time and space, there would be no translation, <laughs> unquote. However, this understanding of translation requires finding a notion of equivalence which, although, I quote Pim again, artificial and fictive, remains essential for the maintenance of countless, countless acts of intercultural communication, unquote. In theater, Patrice Pavi is one of the few theoreticians who have addressed, albeit obliquely, the issue of translation in intercultural performances. He proposed the now extremely well-known model of the intercultural exchange called the hourglass, which we suggested, I, but let's see it again because it's a classic, <laughs> um, in which the source culture will be codified and solidified in diverse anthropological, quote, sociocultural or artistic modelizations and later on filter in a series of adaptations by the target culture and the observer, unquote. This model, of course we all know, was extensively criticized for its rigidity and one-way processual character. Yet Pavi claimed uh, that the appropriation of the culture is never definite uh, and that the hourglass is designed to be turned upside down. Unquote. Aiming to indicate the dynamism inherent in cross intercultural performance, uh, Rustam Baruccia was one of the first scholars to propose an alternative and that was based on the idea of a pendulum. Um, because I'm a graphic person, this was not proposed by Rustam. I, I just have a little diagram, it's on my own, but it looks a little bit like that. Um, in this uh, proto-model, um, since it was never theorized in depth, the constant swing of the pendulum alerts us to the continuous process of exchange which affects the cultures that are party to that specific process. Yet, arguably, to a large extent, I think that both models of intercultural exchange discussed above privilege a translational mode that follows the transfer qualities that Anthony Pym defined as essential to translation. That is, a translation system strongly based on what is known as the sense for sense Western heritage of translation. This sense for sense approach has been criticized as being, a quote, a primary tool of empire, as it encourages colonial powers, or more generally, the stronger or hegemonic cultures to translate foreign texts into their own terms. Thus, eradicating cultural differences and creating a buffer zone of assimilated sameness around them." Unquote. This way of translating or appropriating the other's culture does not take into account power differentials in between cultures and tends to render exotic any possible untranslatability present in this source text. It also establishes a hierarchy between the source and target cultures, and I know that employing the terms source and target is really problematic, but at this point it's actually quite helpful for what I'm trying to say. Uh, it also establishes a hierarchy between the source and target cultures involved in the exchange, reaching even the extreme of rewriting the source text 
in order to make it coherent and valid. What is important to point out is that the sense for sense translation is not the only way in which processes of translation can happen. In recent years, post-colonial theorists have proposed several alternatives to these translation methods, which can be mostly integrated into different tendencies. The first one is known as foreignization strategies, where the translated text remains as close as possible to the original one. Foreignization translations require a pre-existing degree of knowledge of the target culture, sometimes quite extensive. Concepts, terms, geographical places, and states are not explained, but are presupposed to be known in advance. Otherwise, the reader is encouraged to go beyond the text and to begin a quest for understanding of the other culture, which will lead her to other texts or the actual geographical place of the source. Clearly, in these ways of translating, communication between cultures is very difficult to achieve. Indeed, this non-communication is sold as a clear intention of this way of translating. Walter Benjamin, an inspiration for advocates of these trends, argues that, a quote, translation should hold back from communicating and instead reflect the syntax of the original, unquote. The final model of translation offered here is based on hybridization processes. Hybridization translations inhabit the space between cultures and generally make use of pigeonizing and creolizing resources. Persons living in migrant, multicultural environments and or border cultures often exercise hybridization translational strategies. Here, source and target culture coexist in a space where continuous shifts of identities and values are in play. <coughs> Power differentials are present and play an active role in the construction of meanings. Hierarchies between source and target cultures are not rigid because individuals placed inside this liminal sphere treat both cultures reality not as fixed entities, but rather as giving shape to each other. It is within this liminal sphere that the strategies of pigeonizing and creolizing are most effective. Hybridization strategies have been largely articulated through the use of post-colonial theory. As such, it should not surprise us that there is a model in theatrical performative intercultural exchange, and here I'm going away from text and talking about performances. Um, there is a model uh, of intercultural exchange which acknowledges and strives for the occurrence of hybridity. This third model, and it's also really well known, it was proposed by Jacqueline Lowe and Helen Gilbert, and resembles a toy made of a piece of elastic strung to, through the middle of a plastic disc. The diagram reinforces the dynamism present in intercultural exchanges through the existence of centrifugal and centripetal forces of exchange. It also situates this process within a specific socio-political context and pays special attention to issues related to power differentials, quote, agency, hybridity, and authenticity, unquote. Interestingly, to the best of my knowledge, there have not been significant attempts to suggest alternatives to Law and Gilbert's model, which is something that can be interpreted as a proof of its pertinence and relevance. And this model was first published in 2002, so it's, kind of, it's been around for quite a while now, and nobody has said, oh no, I, I want to suggest something that this is not working. However, for me, what this model does not explain is what happens at the moment of the exchange, nor it deals how this process occurs. In other words, what is missing here is the analysis of the translational process of the moving across which occur during the multiple turns of the spinning disk. And this is not coincidental. In the article where this model was first proposed, Law and Gilbert criticized Pavi's <coughs> model for its, I quote, dependence in translation theory, unquote. Mm. Yet, Despite the fact that their own model also relies in, quote, both partners is still undergoing a similar process of filtration and hybridization, unquote, that is, a process of translation, the inner workings of this process are still assumed to be unproblematic and straightforward. It is at this point of time which will be appropriate to question, what is exactly a hybridization strategy of translation? Do they solely refer to the use of pigeonizing and creolizing resources, or are there other ways in, of achieving them? And if so, 
Which ones? As a practitioner researcher, a key question, that was a key question that has driven me to the creation of a number of practice research projects, and one of which I will be discussing next. The project was entitled Time Zones and was first performed in 2011, was directed and co-devised by Dr. Jerry Debu. In time zones, I use England and Mexico's time zones as markers of a constructed personal history in which I evoke my late grandfather and my then four-year-old nephew to explore instances of my own past, presence, and future. Time Zones was a self-declared autobiographical performance piece based on three main stimuli, which later work, uh, which will later work as the devising axis in the creation of my work. The first one was the recognition of time as a culturally regulated phenomenon. Having lived between Mexico and England for the last 16 years, I am now used to constantly adjust my clock, both the internal and the external one, six hours backwards and forwards, constantly. As someone who is deeply interested in intercultural practices that advocate cultural specificity, time, location, and culture appear to be interesting elements to explore as the main materials for the creation of my performance. However, I was not interested in exploring the existence of different temporalities. I was also interested in looking at the interplay and their collision. After all, when I'm in England, there are still some aspects of my life that continue to operate in Mexican time, particularly those moments when I travel from one country to the other and I have to endure a period of jet lag. <laughs> but in the same way, there are also events, news and opportunities that arrive to me with an uncanny delay because of the incompatibility of the time zones that I inhabit. As such, Working with Mexico and England's time zones appear to be an adequate metaphor of my experience of both an immigrant and a migrant. And in here, it is important to stop for a second just to consider in more detail um, the role and function of metaphors so that I can make completely clear that what I'm referring here is not a purely or mere linguistic process. As George Lackoff and Mark Johnson have maintained, it is through metaphors that we articulate our conceptual systems, characterizing our way of communicating and, by extension, our way of living. That was a quote. However, it is also crucial to understand that, and I quote Thomas Soldas here, a metaphor is the critical meeting ground between textuality and embodiment, unquote. This is an insight that was first proposed by uh, an anthropologist called Lawrence Kirmaya, who, when discussing healing practices around the world, around the world stated that, I quote, metaphorical thinking conjoins sensory, affective, and motivational levels of representation in which that can help account for physio-psychological effects on symbolic interventions. Metaphors transform our perceptions and representations by moving them through sensory, affective, and abstract conceptual spaces." Unquote. Furthermore, a metaphor is always, quote, grounded in the body and emerges from it, producing categories of thought and experience as well as being culturally produced. Unquote. In other words, metaphors allow us to grasp in uncertain terms, in uncertain terms the, the perpetual interplay between embodiment and textuality, and as such, are exceptional vehicles to draw upon when engaging processes of cultural translation. Returning to the process of creation of time zones, I would like to go and talk about the second stimulus uh, that I used to create my work and which was uh, paradoxically uh, an event that took place before my decision to work with the idea of time as a culturally regulated phenomenon. And I was first inspired to create this piece when I discovered a photograph of my late grandfather in his early teens. My grandfather uh, passed away when I was four years old, so I have really few memories of him, and most of them are of him as a very tall and elderly presence. Um, However, in those photographs, I clearly saw my face reflected on his, and the likeness awoke a vivid sense of belonging. I then thought that it would be interesting to devise a pitch of work in which I could explore my own genealogy and heritage. And since the image of my grandfather pointed towards my past, 
I started looking for a figure that could embody the notion of my future. And not having kids of my own, I decided to include my nephew, Richie, in that performance. Mm -hmm. Little guy over there. And then I started to become increasingly excited about the possibility of creating a series of fictional encounters between my late grandfather and my young nephew. <laughs> the third um, stimulus um, axis of my performance, and probably the crucial one, was of a completely different nature. In 2007, trying to eliminate the widespread perception of legitimacy towards his government, the then Mexican president Calderón declared a war to all drug cartels operating in the country. Since then, the violence and criminality there has increased tenfold, and as a result, more than 150,000 people have died, and thousands of thousands of people have gone missing. Entire regions of the country are literally no-go areas, and in the UK, a couple of years ago, the Home Office declared that half of Mexico was unsafe to visit. Even though the situation in Mexico is being, recalled, is, uh, being reported and discussed widely in the British media, when I first started devising this performance, there was a scarce recognition of the level of violence happening in Mexico. Raising awareness of these painful and unjustified acts of violence became the final stimulus of my work. And I decided I could use my story to tell the story of a country that is going through a critical time. It is also very important to clarify that in order to develop this piece within the intersection of the three axes described above, I had to situate my work within the tenets of both intercultural and autobiographical performances. This was my story. But it was also a story that occurred across two different geographical spheres and several different temporal realms too. Interesting enough, one of the first problems that I faced with devising this piece was a concern which is common to a significant number of practitioners that do autobiographical work how to produce material which can resist notions of essentialism, authority, and authenticity. This is further complicated when situated within an intercultural terrain, as it is virtually impossible to move across, i.e. to translate, culturally specific events of such horrific nature, which are resorting to imperialistic and appropriating strategies. And one of the key aims of this project was to develop a number of hybridization and translational strategies that could render this project feasible. From an autobiographical point of view, my personal story was merely the channel through which a larger political situation in Mexico was communicated, translated. From an intercultural perspective, the story needed to remain firmly attached to the personal in order to avoid cross-generalizations and reductions that could reduce its cultural specificity. One of the strategies that I pursued to tackle the difficulties mentioned above was to treat my own life, my bios, as metaphorical. And as such, my own story became the story of many. A decision that was reflected in the creation of multiple selfhood that populated my performance. In the performance, I played the roles of my grandfather, of my nephew, of many different versions of Victor, and many other incidental characters. And from the outset, it must be recognized that this strategy was not merely an artistic or aesthetic device. The ramifications of presenting the self in performance as something other than a coherent and homogeneous entity has a strong political connotations that may affect the piece's potential reception. As Dick Hedon has rightly pointed out, quote, the playing of multiple selves is a political act that resists the authority accruing to the I since, it's in, since it renders it unknowable. Unquote. As I have also mentioned before, it was important for me to make patently clear that what I was presenting in my performance was just not about me, and that meant playing in a very open manner with the idea of who I was. The interplay of cells was rather evident in a small scene situated shortly after the beginning of my performance. In there, after a small discussion about quantum physics, uh, as you always start uh, performances, I proclaim that I was a time traveler. Uh, an ability that I developed through my many years of going backwards and forwards in the future, six hours and six hours back in the future. And as a proof of my ability to show the, 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 the audience that this was actually true, I then proceeded to Skype myself. <laughs> and I, this is because I'm actually quite proud of it. I have to stress, this was an actual Skype call. It was not a recording of a Skype call. I was placing a real Skype call and I was answering myself in the Skype call. Uh, in, 
in front of the audience and projected onto a big screen on the back of the stage. And then I had a brief conversation with my past self. And we started talking about a series of topics that included my extended family and the conditions of the performances I was experiencing at the time. Having a conversation with a film version of myself may have been interpreted as a latent critique to issues of authorship as described by Walton Benjamin in the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Or the other eye on the screen also may have alluded to process of alterity found in Lacan's mirror stage, that other eye whom returns her look onto herself. Yet, one of the elements that interests me the most in that Skype conversation with my past self occurred at the beginning of the scene. On the screen, my past eye greeted my present eye in Spanish. On stage, present eye addressed past eye in English. Thus, there was an artificial inference that there existed a discreet Spanish-speaking Victor who could converse with his English counterpart. In fact, it can be argued that the eye on stage became in itself a metaphor for a process of translation, an eye which translates himself to himself in a continuous state of becoming. Meaningfully, this translation does not follow a sense-for-sense -sense approach, as there is no attempt to achieve any notion of equivalency. This translation is always incomplete, partial, and fractured, and yet the hyphenated encounter between these two eyes facilitated a process of creation in which a complex network of histories, meaning, sensations, oral and visual stimuli began to unravel. Both my fictive and real bios literally exploded in a way that appeared to be rhizomatic. In this context, it's important to remember that the Luz and Gattari have argued that, quote, the rhizomatic the rhizome, the rhizome operates by variation, expansion, conquest, capture, offshoots. The rhizome pertains to a map that must be produced, constructed, a map that is always detachable, connectable, reversible, modifiable, and has multiple entryways and exit and its own lines of flight." Unquote. And these rhizomatic conditions were particularly evident in the development of a genealogy situating my grandfather, my nephew Rich, and I in a metaphorical time zone of my own creation, allow me to interweave the stories with my own. In the piece, my bio was presented through some actions and events that have actually taken place within my life experience. However, some of those events were taken out of sequence. Some of them were attributed to my nephew or my grandfather and were enacted by them. Some of them were exaggerated, some of them were borrowed from other sources, and sometimes made up completely. As such, through the fictional intergenerational encounters, the figures of my grandfather and my nephew became not only my alter egos, but also further divisions of an already fractured self. Moreover, the inclusion of a genealogy also resulted in the creation of an intertextual autobiography. Aiming to highlight the artificial construct of my family history, I mythologized it and I related to Aztec creation myths, or I adopted references from key narratives within the Latin American literature canon, such as the inclusion of an all-powerful absent figure, the cacique, as found in novels uh, such as Pedro Paramo or A Hundred Years of Solitude. Of all those references, my favorite one was the section when I recounted the foundation of the Ladron de Guevara dynasty, my grandfather's surname. The following is a really brief excerpt of the dialogue that I use in the performance and of an image that I use to illustrate the dialogue. <coughs> and the image, the dialogue goes like that. My grandfather was a hit with the ladies. <laughs> and like the land that he lived on, he was quite fertile. <laughs> he had six legitimate children um, with my grandmother. Uh, one of my, my mother was the youngest and lots of illegitimate ones. We don't even know how many. I, I'm not joking here. Th there is a little town in the state of Jalapa, uh, in the state of Veracruz, very near the Gulf of Mexico, about four hours away from Jalapa. And the, the, the town is called uh, Ladron de Guevara town. Uh, that town is full of Ladron de Guevaras. Uh, I, I'm not saying that they are all my grandfathers, but, but they look suspiciously like me. <laughs> Unquote. Uh, the complexity and richness of these networks of interconnections seem to indicate to me the appropriateness of using rhizomes as hybridization strat translational strategies. That is, 
The exploration of hyphenated space, which resulted in the development of a network which is not hierarchical. And the continuous exploration of the rhizome, both through its process of devising and of its actual performance, resulted in an extremely pleasurable experience for me as a performer. The process I'm trying to indicate here roughly approximates uh, that which Mikhail Echitza Mikhaili has described as a state of flow. For Mikhail Mikhaili, quote, in the flow state, actions follow up our actions according to an internal logic that seems to need no conscious intervention on our part. We experience it as a unifying flow from one movement to the next in which we feel in control of our actions and in which there is little distinction between self and the environment, between mm. stimulus and response and between past, present, and future." Unquote. For Sister Mikhaili, the flow experience, uh, a state where there is no disorder to straighten out, no threat for the self to defend against, unquote, is the ultimate aspect of happiness. And I must admit that while performing this piece, the ludic enjoyment of flowing through multiple to selves, histories, and meanings did produce in me a state that felt like happiness. Yet, as Gizek has warned us, quote, in psychoanalysis, the betrayal of desire has a precise name, happiness, unquote. In Welcome to the Real, uh, in Welcome to the Desert of the Real, we're discussing the ideological constraints of happiness after 9-11. Gizek uh, reminds us that, quote, in a strict Lacanian sense of the term, we should thus posit that happiness relies on the subject's inability or on readiness fully to confront the consequences of its desire. The price of happiness is that the subject remains stuck in the inconsistency of its desire." Unquote. In a certain way, the inconsistency of my desire is unavoidably linked to an underlying void, a traumatic blind spot. It is not coincidence, for example, that the format that I chose for my piece was within the time travel genre. It is important to point out that time travel narratives were explored by Lacan as ways of exemplifying the way in which psychological symptoms function. And the work of scholars such as Aris Mazujanis and Roger Lockhurst have made patently clear the close relationship between time travel narratives and trauma. And the eruption of trauma in the present paper has somehow problematized the use of Chisa Mikhaili's concept of flow. Nevertheless, it should also be remembered that one of the key aims of this project was to translate that trauma caused by the death and disappearance of thousands of people in Mexico. And it can be argued that this translation might not have been possible without having achieved that state of flow in the exploration of that rhizomatic construction. And the rhizome is never limited to that which already exists as it's always in a state of becoming. One of the aims of my performance was to indicate the existence of alternative paths to the disastrous situation that Mexico is passing by. Hedon has pointed out that, quote, the performance of personal narratives might bring hidden, denied, or marginalized experience in the spotlight, proposing other possible life paths, unquote. Towards the end of my performance, I referred to the possibility of my nephew becoming one of the people responsible for the violence as a grown-up, in other words, a thief, criminal, a murderer, and the whole performance is then revealed to be a warning from the future, letting him know that he has a choice not to become hurt. In a modest way, the whole piece aimed to be a small site of resistance. And in this respect, the use of rhizomes as translational strategies appear to be coherent, as the Luz and Qatari indicated that rhizomatic thinking had a clear political underpinning and was aimed to develop new ways of thinking and doing. Yet, I think that we need to be quite careful with doing grand claims, grand claims because once again, Gisek, uh, talking about uh, Shrek, offers us a cautionary note when analyzing the subversive character of mainstream films that appear to break all canons. Gisek sustains that, quote, instead of praising these displacements and reinscriptions too readily as potentially subversive, and elevating Shrek into yet another site of resistance, we should focus on the obvious fact that through all these displacements, the same old story is being told. In short, the true functions of these displacements and subversions is precisely to make the traditional story relevant to our postmodern age, and thus to prevent us from replacing it with a new narrative." Unquote. And it's equally important to remember that the work of Deleuze and Qatari and more particularly the use of rhizomes, has also been criticized for reproducing, I quote, some of the very discourses of exclusion 
that these alternative conceptions of Westernness were intended to oppose. Quote. Therefore, I feel that I need to ask myself, is the narrative of my life history, of my life history presented in my performance unique, radical, different? Not really. In time zones, my bio was also anchored in a series of Latin American texts that narrate the process of corruption of the innocent child into the macho patriarch. Men who attempt to dominate the social and political environment, such as novels written by Carlos Fuentes, like The Good Conscience, or by Romulus Gallegos in Canaima. In other words, is the narrative that I presented in this performance completely circumscribed to a cyclical understanding of reality where there is no possible way out? And more importantly, for the uh, purpose of this paper, is the reality, is that reality actually translatable in non-arboreal ways? My hunch is that as Lowe and Gilbert's model of the disc continue to spin, the clash and encounter of the different registers produces translations that are at times arboreal, that's sense for sense translation, at times foreignizing and at times hybridizing, and even perhaps some very few times rhizomatic. However, it may also be that what I have described here are in fact not hybridization strategies, but are coming closer to that which I have described as foreignization strategies. That is, perhaps, that they are surrounding on its own circuit and not, not translatable and not understandable. If so, the betrayal of these translations may not reside in their inability to remain faithful to the original, but their impossibility to create difference. Thank you.